I've already experienced the company's brand new four-door supercar, with Tiff wringing the neck of the new Rapid S. <laughs> now I want to delve into the historic heart of the company. From 1957 to 2007, this Newport Pagnell site was Aston Martin's Global HQ. 15,000 cars rolled out of its gates. It's now home to a state-of-the-art showroom and is the base for the jewel in Aston's crown, their heritage centre. The master craftsmen here are internationally renowned for their immaculate restorations. Manager Graham Darby is granting me privileged access to this hallowed ground. So this is Heritage Restoration Centre. Yes. Yeah. In here we do all the mechanical work on heritage vehicles. Every type of Aston ever made has visited this workshop, including this Thunderbird-style Lagonda. A DB6 once owned by Paul McCartney, and their most famous model of all, the 007 DB5. So basically, I mean, going all the way back to this? Yes, 1925. Pretty much everything. Nine, 100 years worth of motoring. Absolutely, yes. In here, being restored. An average length of restoration? Uh, 12 to 14 months. OK. Can I talk about money? How much, how much does it cost, say, that, that, that two over there? How I much, prefer not cost? to discuss I know, that. But just a roundabout number, what? Uh, depending on the base vehicle, you'll get change out of 300,000. Modern manufacturing sees body panels being put through all manner of robotically controlled heating, cutting and shaping processes. This ensures incredible consistency and a quick turnaround of parts, but doesn't involve a fraction of the human skill in here. As the original Astons weren't made by robots, they're not restored by them either. Each aluminium panel is cut and hammered by hand before being smoothed using a technique called rolling and then welded into place. This rolling is the hardest job of all and a skill I'm being taught by shop manager Charlie Briggs. How do you kind of visualise in your mind where this metal needs to stretch to give it the shape? OK, well, for this instance, and, and any... Any panel that we do, like a new panel we haven't done before or regular, we start off literally with a piece of iron like this. Yeah. We'll lay it on the shape that we want. Yeah. And then we'll just let it settle down. And this will tell us, just by looking at looking yeah, where, it, where it puckers up, where there's too much material or where there's not enough material. Ah, so there's, a, there's obviously a bit too much yeah, there. Yeah, so there, where you've got that yeah. pucker up there, there's too much. So we've either got to crimp that or stretch this. So that whole front section... Yeah. How long does that take? In man hours, uh, about 150 hours. Wow, that's amazing. Right, so what's, what's this called? Is this, this is the English wheel, right. and uh, this is what allows us to stretch metal. Each time you uh, approach a job, uh, the first thing you have to do, obviously get the right wheel in for the job you want to do. So. Oh, so you've got different shapes of this wheel? That's right, yeah, you get different profiles, they'll obviously give you different curves. And so this is all done by eye, this is just a bit of feel? And... All done by eye, yeah. So this is how you make an Aston Martin DB5. This is how you make an Aston Martin DB5 nose panel. Well, it's, a, it's much softer than I thought. It is, it's a feel thing, isn't it? You've got to, you've got to not only with your eyes, but you've got fit, feel, feel it in your yeah, hands. Yeah, exactly. All the senses are uh, working for you. By moving the panel across the wheels smoothly, I'm changing the shape of it in two planes simultaneously. So what happens if you go diagonally too much? Well, you'll start to bring it off across, bring it up in a diagonal fashion, so you'll end up with a ridge going God through it. Almighty. After working for half an hour, it was time to find out if I could ever qualify as a panel beater for this most revered of establishments. So, uh, am, I, am I doing all right, do you think? Well, let's have a quick look. Let's have a quick look. It's not too bad. I mean, for a first attempt, I think I'll give you a seven and a... Yeah. Seven out of a hundred, that's a good score. Yeah. <laughs> Not a bad first go, but I don't think I'd ever have the skills to work on this. A very famous DB5, that was the Heritage Centre's biggest ever project. You're probably thinking that this is James Bond's DB5 from Goldfinger and Skyfall. But I've got a little secret for you. Despite both films apparently using the same DB5, they were actually different cars. This one was used 
in Skyfall. But it was painstakingly restored here at Aston Martin to be an exact replica of the Goldfinger car. And I think you'll agree, the detail is mind-blowing. They say you should never meet your heroes. But later, I'm behind the wheel of Bond's car, and I'm hoping it'll blow my mind. The DB5, Aston Martin's greatest icon. In the year of their 100th birthday, it's only right fifth gear pays tribute to the greatest car they've ever made. James Bond's company car was launched in 1963 and it cost £4,175, almost twice the price of an average house. But for all its quintessential Britishness, it was actually designed by an Italian firm, Carrozzeria Touring Superleggera. How beautiful is that? So this car was in Skyfall, yeah? This is the car used in the movie, yes, for the driving scenes. What's the story? We were approached by the uh, movie makers that they needed a spare car. Obviously, we don't have too many Bond 5s <laughs> just parked up. <laughs> we were very lucky that we did have a DB5 correct year in storage waiting for restoration. So we spoke to the owner of the car, explained that we'd like to convert his car to a Bond replica uh, for the movie. Uh, he was over the moon yeah, that we could do so. He was. And there's one other gem of information about this car. Yes. And that is, what's the chassis number on this? The oh, genuine oh, chassis the number. The genuine chassis number from production is 007. Can you catch your breath? Unbelievable. Today, DB5 start at around 300 grand. But in 2010, we followed the sale of the original Goldfinger DB5, complete with gadgets, where the hammer came down to an American banker for 2.6 million pounds. This modern day version is worth a slightly smaller fortune and now I get to tell you what it's like to drive. So not only am I driving it today, but you're letting me have it for the weekend, is that right? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> How can I get it for the weekend? Is it possible? No. That's not very James Bond, that, that key ring though, is it? Do you reckon Daniel Craig's touched these keys, do you reckon? Odd job's had that one, hasn't he? You know, this is a, it's an emotive... Oh, it makes you feel amazing just driving this car, you know? You feel everybody coming the other way almost wants to stop and stare at it. And this is a very, very big occasion for me, so let's get the basics out of the way before I get, well, a bit carried away. Stats-wise, it's a four-litre straight-six, got 282 horsepower, It'll go on to an amazing 145 miles an hour. I feel mint, and I'm only cruising. And this is an old-school engine, you know, there's no direct fuel injection or electronic ignition. It's got three whacking great big carburettors. You can kind of hear them sucking and pouring petrol into the engine. As a cruiser, oh, it's lovely, it's, it's soft and compliant. Yeah, the seats really don't hold you in that much, but actually, I can't think of anything better. Charged up and down the country roads of England, or even on the Riviera. Actually, stuff England, let's find the Riviera. Now, in 1963, this was the absolute pinnacle of luxury. I mean, look at it, look at these seats, they're amazing. The dashboard, look at this, electric windows in 63. Adjustable suspension, five-speed gearbox. It doesn't get much better. I bet a few of you are wondering, you know, can you draw any comparisons to modern Aston Martins? Well, there is one thing which is identical, and that's you feel really special when you're driving it. It's not the first time Aston have made a new Bond DB5. A while ago, they went to enormous lengths for a wealthy Arab customer, installing replica gadgetry and even producing an owner's manual in the style of Q Branch. But no matter how immaculately rebuilt the cars are, you can never hide the fact that they're 50 years old. By modern car standards, you know, it doesn't handle very well, it hasn't got lots of grip. Brakes don't give you a lot of confidence. Yeah, 
no power steering, quite heavy. You know, I don't want to insult the car, but it's kind of a bit wallowy, but in a nice, classic way. You know, I, I don't want to be flat out chucking around country lanes. I want to be enjoying watching other people watching me. It's a work of art on wheels. I love it. I want it. It's a beautiful thing. Happy 100th, Aston. It's funny enough, I would say 99.99% of cars I drive, I just want to drive them fast. I just want to get my foot hard in. But actually, there's an enormous amount of respect, which is unusual for me. I want to look after it, caress it, not drive it too hard. But, you know, I can be bad once, can't I? And it's...